killing any of his victims. And so he could sneak in and sneak out successfully. But one time he accidentally bumped a lamp and this couple in bed sat up. They flipped on the light switch. He looked at him and he said, I'm so sorry to awaken you. I, I am the polite burglar and I never awaken my victims. However, I must have messed up. And so I don't have any choice now. Thank you, Jeff. I don't have any choice except to shoot you. Uh, <laughs> but since I am the polite burglar, let me ask you your names. And so he pointed the gun at the woman, at the wife, and, and she said, well, my, 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 name, my, my, my name is Elizabeth. He said, oh, my goodness. Now what am I going to do? My mother's name is Elizabeth. <laughs> And I'm the polite burglar. I can't shoot somebody whose name is Elizabeth. So he pointed the gun at the man. And he said, what's your name? He said, well, my, 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 my name is Bubba, but my friends call me Elizabeth. <laughs> well, he's not the only one who finds himself stuttering in the face of fear. We live in the most fear-filled generation in the history of the world. No other generation has been forced to live under the ominous threat of nuclear attack, global warming, and no one else has been encircled with so many constant reminders of fear. So I want to talk to you about how to face your fears. Now, we talked a lot about fear in this congregation about a year ago. Some of you may remember that we looked at all of the statements in which Jesus said, do not be afraid. And then we turned our attention to studying through the story. And now, a year after the study of fear, I've still been working on this topic because I have a book coming out in a couple of months called Fearless. And when we were selecting topics for our Summer at the Hills studies, these independent med messages, we thought, well, maybe, maybe we'll go back to that fear topic one more time because I've come across some things that were not a part of the original series. So some of what you hear is going to be review. Much of what you hear may be brand new, but all of what you hear, hopefully, will encourage you to trust more and to fear less. Let's pray together, and then we'll get to work. Most Heavenly Father, we ask now that you please have mercy upon the one who speaks for his sins are many. And help us to see Jesus and just Jesus. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said. Amen. At 8.17 p.m. on the evening of March the 3rd, 1943, air raid alarms erupted in the skies over London, England. People heard the sounds and responded in fear. Bus drivers immediately pulled over to the side of the boulevards. Motorists screeched their brakes and jumped out of their cars. People began screaming, they're going to drop them, they're going to drop them. And they raced through the streets. They could hear the sound of anti-aircraft artillery in the distance and they searched the sky for sightings of Nazi planes and the fact that they did not see a single one did nothing to dampen their hysteria many of them raced in the direction of an underground station called Bethnal underground station 500 people already occupied the station before the alarms went out. 1,500 reached it within the next 10 minutes. Trouble began when a mother carrying a child descended the 19 uneven steps down into the underground station and she lost her footing and she fell. She threw off the rhythm of the oncoming traffic of people and people began to fall in on top of each other like laundry in a laundry basket the next wave of safety seekers upon seeing 
the crowd or the congestion at the entrance determined that someone must have locked the doors because fear always assumes the worst. And so they began to press, and they began to press. And the result was 15 minutes of deadly chaos. It took four hours to disentangle the bodies. At the end, there were 173 men, women, and children who died. And not a single bomb had been dropped. Fusillades didn't kill the people. What did? Fear did. Fear loves a good stampede. Fear loves a good stampede. Fear's payday is heightened panic. Disquiet. Anxiety. And I would suggest to you that fear has been making a good living lately. They're talking layoffs at work, slowdowns in the economy, upswings in global warming, downturns in good health. Some demented dictator is collecting nuclear missiles like others collect fine wines. We're reminded daily that if the wrong person pushes the wrong button, the whole earth can go up in smoke. And the consequence is a generation of fear. We take more mood-altering drugs than any other generation in history. One psychologist recently determined that the average child today lives with the same amount of fear as a psychiatric patient in the 1950s. Part of the reason is simply the barrage of fear that we face. It's on every cable channel. It's on every news network. One study determined that the use of the phrase at risk in certain major newspapers has increased by nine times during a five-year period. Someone has learned if you use the phrase at risk in an article, it grabs the attention of the reader. I don't think the world is nine times as dangerous as it was five years earlier. But someone has learned that fear builds an audience. That's why just before the news breaks and goes to a commercial, the reporter will say, stay tuned, coming up next, what you do not know about the water you drink. <laughs> they got us. What you do not know about letting your wife shop alone. <laughs> they got us. <laughs> what you do not know about sitting in traffic. And they got us because fear sells. Fear glues the audience to its seats. Fear sells magazines and newspapers. So one reason we feel fear is because fear is everywhere. It's all around us. People are speaking fear into our lives every single day about what we eat, about what we breathe, about where we walk. But the other reason we feel fear is because it is a dangerous time. It is a frightening time to be alive. So what do we do? Well, I think we're reminded, first of all, that fear serves a purpose. That fear is a gift of God. That fear, in its original sense, in its first sense, is intended to alarm us to oncoming danger. Feeling fear is not bad. The feeling of fear will keep you from crossing a busy street, smoking a pack of cigarettes, or staying in a burning building. Fear is the canary in the coal mine. It, rem it, it alarms us to impending danger. So the presence of fear is not the problem. It's the persistence of fear. You see, fear in and of itself is not a sin. Fear is not a sin. But fear can lead to sin. Inappropriate treatment of fear can lead to sin. If I try to medicate my anxieties by excessive use of pharmaceutical drugs or alcohol, if I indulge in escapes with pornography or shopping or even in athletic activity, if I try to respond to my fear with vice-like control, then fear turns me into a person that I do not want to be. 
And fear turns me into a person that God does not want me to be. The scripture teaches us that God has not given us a spirit of fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear. There is the purpose of fear. Fear will always knock at your door. The trick is to not invite fear in to spend the night. And certainly never rented out a room. <laughs> you see, the, the deal with fear is that fear is based on a lie. And if you want to look on your outline, it's on the inside panel of your handout. Fear is based on a lie. Here's what fear says. Here's what your fear says. Your fear says no one is in control. And that is a scary thought. When you think no one is in control, it's a scary situation in which to be. The reason that we're afraid of heights is one step, one false step, and we're spinning out of control. The reason we don't like to fly is because we're not in the cockpit. We're not in control. The reason we don't like public speaking is because we don't like the thought that we can't control how people respond. The reason we don't like crowds, uh, the, the reason we don't like intimacy, the reason we don't like the thought of being married or being alone, the reason we don't like the next chapter of life is because we're afraid that we will go into a part of life that we cannot control. The reason that some people don't like to ride in a car that they're not driving is why? Because someone else is in control and they are not. And there's this false feeling of security that comes when we think we are in control. So fear is the perception that the world is out of control. Fear is the perception that the world is out of control. My world is out of control. And that's a very scary thought. So that happens to all of us. Now the question is, what do I do with it? What do I do with it? Well, some people respond to this perception that the world is out of control by trying to control a part of their world, right? They try to control a part of their world. They can't control everything in their world, but by golly, I'm going to control this part of my world. And they become what we typically call obsessive compulsive over a certain behavior, a certain activity. For example, keeping a house clean. There's nothing wrong with keeping a house clean. I don't buy into it much myself. But, <laughs> but I appreciate people who are tidy. But there can be that situation in which a person says, you know, my world is spinning out of control, but for crying out loud, this house is going to be spotless. And I mean, there's not going to be one speck of dust. There's never going to be a sock that's going to hit the ground. There's never going to be a dirty, dirty plate in the sink. And they can literally drive other people. You know that person. <laughs> Nothing wrong with having a clean house. But when you're thinking that controlling that house and the tidiness thereof will eliminate fear, it's giving you a false sense of security. One curious way that fear uh, manifests itself in some people is by trying to control their diet, their food, or lack thereof. A curious manifestation of fear in our generation has been the decision of some people not to eat. I'll just starve myself. Or I'll just eat so little. Where in the world does that come from? Here's where it comes from. I can't control the economy. I can't control what my parents think. I can't control what my boyfriend thinks. But by goodness gracious, I can control what goes down my esophagus. And it's, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a subtle act of defiance. It's an act of defiance. Here's one area of my... Yes, it's destructive. Yes, it doesn't work. Yes, it creates more problems than it solves. But yes, it's an actual manifestation of fear. Others try to deal with the problem of fear not by controlling a house or, or controlling what they eat, but they try to control human beings. I can't control everybody in the world, but boy, my family's going to walk in lockstep. My children are going to do what I tell them to do. My husband's going to straighten up. My wife is going to know what it's about. Anybody who works for me, boy, they're going to get it. And so they control. This isn't just coaching. This isn't just helping. But it's, it's demanding that people live a certain way because as they do, that gives you a feeling of, I'm in charge. 
or I, or, 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 or I have, I, have I, I, I am controlled. 